We're using a software product here. This can apply to any software product. It can apply to things you're doing in Excel and so forth. Basically what you want to accomplish is what the basic tasks that I'm talking about. Uh, so we'll cover a number of things from setup to organization to some takeoff items to uh, producing uh, variations on the estimate after it's in, while it's in process or even after it's done. Because if there's uh, once in a while, somebody will say, what if I change that? Well, that, what will that cost? You know, just every so often. <laughs> and then, then they might even say, well, let's change it again, and let's change it again and again. And then by the time you do it for the fifth time, they go, well, how come this is so much more expensive than the second one? Things like that. We want to give you some insight on how to answer those kind of questions that you're going to need to at times. You're going to need to be able to revise those estimates. You're going to need to say, well, what if we did that? What would that cost extra? And let's leave that as an alternate. So we'll, figure, we'll talk to you about alternates and how to handle alternates and how to incorporate them into your bid later if you want to or if you need to. So uh, is there anything here you'd like to know specifically? Because we, we'll, we'll work it in one way or the other. All right. If you think of something along the way, throw it up and we'll deal with it. All right. So I'm going to kind of turn over to Kevin. Basically what we're going to start off with <clears throat> is basically just starting up an estimate. And a few of the things we want to do when you, when you first start a new, a new project. So. So when I go off and create a project in this particular product and so forth, there's just a couple of things to just kind of get it started where it wants to know an estimate name, uh, what database I'm potentially going to be pulling prices from and so forth, which the pricing can come from a multitude of varying places depending on your company. So with a lot of time when I work with an Excel spreadsheet, my data is pretty much whatever's in that spreadsheet. So if I've had one spreadsheet that we've copied through the years or one estimator has one version of it and another estimator has another version of it, you know, that's where some of the estimating systems bring a great advantage of having a common database that no matter who's doing estimating from, there's some sort of a baseline to get me started on what are the big bolded items that I want to make sure it's accounted for and things of that nature. So with this, I'm just going to go ahead and use like a general contracting database. We'll just talk about some basic items when we put them into the estimate and so forth that pretty much should make sense to most people just taking off like a slab or something of that nature but keep in the back of your mind that it doesn't much matter the content of what we're taking off because it doesn't much matter if it's a concrete slab it's a wood frame wall it's uh, um, you know acoustical ceilings and things like that the concept and the principle is exactly the same uh, no matter what this content is that I might be pulling together as far as you know how we organized content and, and sort it out and so forth. One thing before you go, we use, we're using Estimate 8 as the name of this particular file. We would not recommend using <laughs> Estimate 8 as yeah, the name of your file. <laughs> so, so one of the things you want to do when you are, when you're thinking about estimating overall is come up with a naming convention <coughs> so that you can go back and find the thing later. Okay, because as we talked about variations and alternates and things of that nature, if you don't have a good naming convention, you're going to have a really hard time going back and finding that thing. And it's also very possible that you do, a, do an estimate and the project goes, goes silent. Nine months later, the project, somebody goes, hey, remember that job? Well, they want to get started now. And now you're looking, trying to find, and, but they want to revise some things. Now you've got to go find that estimate. And you gotta make your revisions and so on. So one thing you always want to do, come up with a naming convention for your estimates. Make sure you can find them again. Make sure that if there's a revision, you're making a copy of your original. Never overwrite your original. Make a copy of the original, re rename the copy appropriately, version two with you know additions as of you know two one. 2018, whatever it takes, make the names long if you have them, but make them descriptive. So I'm going to go ahead and accept it here, and this is going to bring up something called a information page. So when you think about 
spreadsheets and all these separate files. You know, one of the things that was mentioned there is putting a good name in, but it's also putting in some of this good content here. Because all this information can be searchable later to come back and find that estimate. So if I know that's that Audubon job that was a $2.1 million contract, that was that job that we did that was in uh, Kentucky or whatever the case is. A lot of time when I go back to find an estimate later, it's not necessarily the name that may trigger it. It's some little oddball, that was that weird client name or that was this name or something of that nature that there's some other little tidbit. The more information you can put in here and organize can make it a lot more retrievable later. I don't know how many people I've worked with that will sit there and Ah, is that the file there? No, close it down. Is this one here? And you end up hunting and pecking through a bunch of files trying to find the exact you know, one you want to go back and rework and so forth. The other thing we'll talk about, this, this information will also become important later on. Because one of the things we want to talk about is bid management. So, you know, there's, it's one thing to put together an estimate. It's another thing to manage a lot of estimates over a period of time. Because you do need to refer back to them. Sometimes people refer back to them and said, you know, it may be a totally different job, maybe a completely different customer, but it's a very similar project. So you want to refer back to this one. What did I do on this one? How did I price that out? Who did I get prices from? You just want to refer back for informational purposes. So the more information I can put in here to find this, let's be manage these bids later. We'll get into managing the bids late at the end, you know, later in the presentation. But always think about not just, I need to get a number for this project, but think about how I'm going to organize, manage, keep track of my estimates on an ongoing basis. So I don't want to necessarily go through all these fields. I'm just going to kind of you know, browse through a few of them that I think are very relevant. Project type. Most people have some sort of, you know, hey, I want to look at all our healthcare jobs. I want to look at the warehouse jobs. I want to look at you know, whatever that is. So it's just one more way of kind of filtering that information that you know, it's usually pretty key of putting in. Somebody that's a large enough company that they've got multiple estimators. Maybe I want to put the estimator in there so I can tell this estimator versus that estimator. Uh, some clients I work with actually have multiple estimators that work on the same job where they might be put in both of the names and things like that. Because again, I can go back and search for those names or something of that nature to try to find some hit later. Um, or also as a company, maybe I can tell what type of projects are we doing a better success rate on our close ratio. So, you know, some people I talk to say, oh, yeah, we get awarded four out of ten jobs. Well, where is that? Are we doing better right now in the schools? Or are we doing better now in the healthcare? Where should we be really looking at where our better hit ratio is for this particular period of time or something of that nature? These fields down here are actually customizable to what other things you want to track. So, this is also where it's good sometimes to put in other tidbits of information that, there again, can be passed to somebody else. What's the estimated starting date? What's the estimated uh, ending date? What's the liquidated damages if we don't get this done at a particular time? Um, what was the uh, plan date and revision of that set of prints? So, you know, I've got some clients that are actually uh, printing out proposals out of the system where right on their proposal they'll say this estimate was based on plans dated as of whatever. So there again, that piece of paper that's locking me into this has some sort of tie back to that particular version of the estimate um, can be yeah. very key. And that is an excellent point, by the way. You know, keeping track of what what documents did you use to you know compile this estimate with. Uh, that could be an important factor for other people on the team later on. You know, if there comes to be a claim or a challenge on the job later on, that's an important piece of information. So these are a lot of fields that depending on, you know, we might want to put in here things also like what's the square footage of this project or how many stories it is. You know, we're not going to cover all the details of those kind of fields here. But depending on your bid management system after the fact, you can then go and look at the very things, what's the profit margin we typically put on a five to 8,000 square foot project or a 10 to 40,000 square foot project, whatever your parameters are. You can start looking at information in a, from a little bit in a bigger view. You know, there's the term, you know, big data out there right now. This is like mini big data. You know, it's not big massive data, but it's bigger data than that focus on this one particular project. So, and you might want to know, you know, who won it later on too. Because then you can look at it and say, who's getting more of these jobs than us? Sure. There's clients yeah. out there that I work with that 
if they see a particular name on this, they'll know, hey, I may not put as much effort into this one, or I know I'm going to put more effort into this because we've got a higher likelihood of getting it and so forth. So this can kind of help substantiate where are those. So what we're getting at is bidding strategy, really. It's, it's a thought process behind the bid. And you always want to apply that, too. I always have said there's an art and a science to estimating. You know, the art part of it is those intuitive decisions, sometimes factual decisions that you make regarding how much effort we put on here, how much margin do you have we can get by with, who else is bidding this, is this the kind of work we're particularly good at, is this work we're not that great at and we're busy anyway, so we just want to, we will throw a bunch of margin on it, not put a lot of effort behind it if we get it, everybody's happy, and if we don't, we're not worried about it. But you're going to make those kind of art and science type judgments all the time. But unless there's something else here, you think it's pretty good. Nope. Uh, the only other thing I'll mention here on the way out is um, mm -hmm. one of the nice things about a lot of estimating systems over spreadsheets and things like that is the ability to transfer these estimated budgets in potentially into some sort of a job cost system that that way we can track estimated versus actuals and things of that nature uh, if we're awarded the job. So those are things also that um, kind of come in handy in that organizing estimating and so forth. So this first thing I want to go through is just kind of put some information into the spreadsheet and then I want to kind of come back and talk about better ways of organizing it and, and things of that nature. So the first thing I want to just kind of do is I just want to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of the different types of takeoff in the system just to get things in the spreadsheet, just to kind of get that concept across. And then I'm going to wipe it out and actually go through different ways of really organizing that content a lot better. So, if I just start off with a blank spreadsheet here, I can go up to take off something called, uh, let me deal with it. One method is something called quick takeoff in this product and so forth. And the main thing here is just grabbing line items that I'm going to need to price and getting them out to my spreadsheet. So I'm just going to go off and pick a handful of uh, some general condition type of items and so forth to get me started. So maybe I want a supervision, uh, so I need a superintendent out there. Maybe I've got some uh, utilities and things of that nature. So basically, I'm taking standardized pricing, in this particular case, from some sort of a database that's giving me some sort of starting price, starting productivity, something of that nature, and allow me to put that content back into the spreadsheet. So as fast as I give it some sort of an idea of duration of time, maybe all the math and all that type of stuff could be done automatically. So, a couple of quick notes here. One thing Kevin's getting at too is the reason he's starting off without organizing and things like that is the fact of the matter is you're going to run across these small little jobs. You're doing it. You're going to do it for a customer that you like. It's not the kind of thing you'd really like to do, but because they're a customer, you're going to go out and replace those five doors. You're going to go pour that, you know, 40 foot of sidewalk or whatever the little job is. And so, oftentimes, it doesn't. You don't have to go in and put a lot of organization at every last single bit, you still want to name it well. You still want to organize it, don't get me wrong. But you can do this quick and dirty kind of takeoff, whether it's a spreadsheet or whatever it is, boom, 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 got a total, put my add-ons on it, put a number out to it, right? So this is kind of that quick and dirty, small job type thing. So then ramping it up a little bit, is there's also something called assemblies where I can teach a system how to take off a group of items at once. So, especially for people that self-perform tasks, there's usually a lot more steps than just one line item. So, if I take a look at uh, installing this wall, there's people in the room that might go through and say, yeah, wall, how many a foot? And I'm just going to put a price per foot because I'm going to sub it out, or maybe I'll get a sub and price it for me and things like that. Some other in here might go through and say, nah, that wall's made up of plates and studs and drywall and, and different components to that wall and so forth. So in this case, I'm kind of going off on a, a little bit more detail here. So I'm going to take a look at an assembly then. This is basically has some sort of a list of content of whatever it may look like. So there again, I said that it really doesn't matter if it was a piping, that maybe I've got pipe and fittings and things of that nature, or whether in this case it was a slab where I'm going to have uh, things like fine grade or excavation and vapor barrier and so forth. So the list of content would be basically what's in the database that I'm utilizing. 
But the key to this is then up here at the top, I've got these questions that will help calculate the quantities for me. So when I think about a lot of clients with their spreadsheets and things like that that they've done in the past, you know, most people have some sort of spreadsheet set up. They can put a few numbers in. It'll drop those numbers out and so forth. And maybe they delete the lines that they don't need. One of the things that, that a lot of estimating systems can do is maybe when I start taking a look at something like concrete, maybe I don't want just one price for concrete. Maybe there's multiple strengths. Maybe there's multiple additives. Uh, maybe I need to get a concrete pump on this job. I don't need to on that job. So this list of questions is really almost like a checkoff sheet to make sure that I'm getting the bases covered in what I'm generating. So, which reminds me of a story. Years ago, uh, <clears throat> I was working with a large contractor. We were talking about estimating software. And the senior estimator was probably, I don't know, 65 years old at that time. He's like, all right, what's this going to do for my inexperienced estimators? Because what we had been talking about the whole time was how much faster it was going to pump out their estimates for them, right? He goes, what's it going to do for my inexperienced estimators? And I go, they'll make mistakes that much faster. <laughs> he was like, Ugh. and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, actually, I had to backpedal a little bit. I said, if you're using assemblies, in this case, like these types of assemblies, first of all, you build into an assembly the way you think. All these assemblies can be created by you. They can work exactly the way you think. They can work exactly the way you want. So I said, if you build the assemblies the way you think, they'll actually be forced to perform the estimate exactly the way you would do it because they have to answer these questions or you can make the questions required or you know for sure that they've seen it it's like building in an own your own estimate checklist right did i get this did i get that did i think about this did i get the a dimension in here or not kind of thing so this is a, assemblies in my view are a safeguard to make sure we're getting the, the quantities we need to get an accurate estimate now, I have had people say, I'm not sure I want an accurate estimate. Now, I'm not kidding about this. They go, what do you mean? They go, well, a lot of times I get a job because I forgot something. And with this, I'm not going to forget anything. And so the guy was literally worried about not getting work because he, was, he wouldn't forget anything. <laughs> and we've had one that actually came back and showed me after he got done building this how it was consistently 10% higher than what he'd do by hand because he listed out, here's all the things that I need. Where was like, well, where's that in your hand takeoff? Where's that in your hand takeoff? And so forth. Yeah. That, you know, there's a lot of things that, oh, well, that's really included here. That, you know, I want to break that out so, so what I want is a line I just need. So the, my point is, if we get everything in there accurately, you can choose what you want to forget. So, you know, you could make a decision how badly you want the job or not, in other words. So why not have the decision-making capability? So an assembly function can help really build yourself a checklist, help increase your accuracy substantially, as well as increase the speed of that substantially. And just checklists are a good idea anyway. You know, I don't care what you're using, if you're using Excel, if you're using a yellow pad, I really don't care. But some kind of checklist is sure helpful. Uh, I happen to be a pilot. I fly. I use a checklist. Why do I use a checklist? Because I'd like to live another day. You know, is that quite that desperate here? But you'd like to actually have a job tomorrow. You know, and so the checklist sure helps any any estimating process. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember hearing what the name of the software is and what the data sources that you're using. Is this something that's uh, available to us, or is this something we have to create entirely it is, from scratch? It is available. So uh, Kevin and I made a decision not to uh, talk about product name. Specifically, I'll mention it this more times that you pass, mm -hmm. mainly because we had feedback from the prayer when they were too salesy. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm like, we don't need to talk about the product. If this is Sage Estimating, uh, it used to be Timberline Estimating, it's very widely used, all that kind of thing. So that's, you know, but yes, it is available. Uh, the database, this is one of many that are available for this particular product. There, these kind of databases are available for a lot of estimating products out there. We're not the only one with data behind it and so forth. Um, and the operation of the software is a lot like Excel spreadsheet, much of it. So a lot of it applies there. A lot of the practices that we're talking about apply regardless of what you're doing. And so we really don't want this to be a sales pitch for the product, we really don't. Um, because everything we're talking about here applies across the board. I don't care how you put this together. 
So, Thank you. But yeah. So I'm just going to go ahead and put some numbers through here. So, you know, first off, I can tell it the square footage of the slab. So right off the bat, a little bit of reminder. Do I need gravel? Do I need sand? Am I going to have to put something under it? So instead of me just taking off the concrete by itself, I've already started the motion kind of going on. What about this? What about this? And kind of going through that kind of a safety net there type of thing. So I'm going to say that I need uh, four inches of gravel. But I can always say zero. I don't need some, any sand underneath the slab or something of that nature. So. Um, you know, I can go down through there and just answer the questions as I see fit. The strength of the concrete, uh, different types of concrete and so forth. So there again, all coming up with ways instead of maybe just a line item in a spreadsheet, maybe it can go off to a database of pricing or things of that nature, but something in the spreadsheet appropriate to, you know, how you answer them and so forth. Then I'll put the edge forms. turn down the edges and so forth. So, you know, I'm just going to kind of fly through the rest of these because it's kind of irrelevant. But the main thing is, is whatever you've got to set up to do, it can then come back down and quantify whatever the line items are that was needed. So if it was going to go through and even do something basic like general conditions, you know, do you need to heat this project during the winter? Do you need to have a tool trader on this job site? Whatever that list of content that I want, do I, do I, do I, yes or no, or type of thing, or quantity to try to help make sure that I'm catching all the bases of whatever that picture is that I'm trying to put together. Also in this case, then we see the total for this segment of our quantity survey and take off. So, um, so there's a lot of people yeah. out there that have kind of a, a, you know, if they do something consistently, they have kind of a window where they are kind of expecting. So down here, it's got like my, my thousand square foot. It's got the money associated with whatever is in here so far. And then they, they can kind of give me a unit cost. So that way, you know, one contractor I worked with, it was just kind of funny because he was primarily setting it up for a lot of his other estimators. And everything we did, he had a number in mind that it better be in that window, or we'd have to go back and rework the writing of it. That is a, that's going to be three bucks. If it's not three bucks, we need to figure out why. That it was just like, he had a good enough handle on where he thought those unit prices should be based on that group of content that he knew that there was something out of sync um, and so forth. For you folks that are new to estimating, I will tell you, mm -hmm. if you have an experienced estimator that you can mentor with or refer with, with, do it. Those guys know a lot. It's amazing what they know. Because <clears throat> the, all this stuff we're doing is in some of these guys' heads, literally. And, and so, because I have a lot of guys that can look at this stuff and go, I think you're off. And then you can go back through it and go, yep, right here and right there. Sometimes we'll, we'll look at it and go, you're right. And, you know, we're pretty, there's, back to that whole art and science thing, there is definitely an art and a science to estimate. And uh, the science part, we handle really well. The art part is where you make the decisions, trying to get a feel for it, thinking about conditions, you know, time of year, all those kinds of things come into play when you're putting us. So in this case here, this is kind of an example of what it's, brought back into the spreadsheet at this moment. So as you can tell, I've got my superintendent in here and some of the things that I took off initially. And then a lot of the other stuff kind of organized by, um, you know, however my database is set up. So I've got uh, some different divisions here and so forth. As I'm looking at the different content, the database is a lot like a starting out point. So once I get into the spreadsheet, it's now, you know, my <coughs> ability to change whatever. So that way when I know that this is going to be off on a real rough site, or this is going to be somewhere odd that I can't deal with on a regular basis, so that uh, maybe I've got some uh, uh, issues getting the concrete chucked back there. So maybe, you know, instead of the three hours that it initially took, I'm going to say it's going to take them a whole day to get that done and so forth, that I can sit there and put those what ifs to it. Because a lot of times that's one of the things that also kind of concern people when they put estimates together is, well, shoot, I, this job's different. So I've got to have that flexibility to kind of go in there and and change yeah. things up a little bit. And one thing, you know, everybody tends to look at things a little differently, you know. Um, and so we try to open up, have enough columns here to give information. As an example, you see, you know, a dollar per cubic yard, or number of cubic yards per hour. We can give you a dollar amount per yard. We can give you a dollar amount per square foot. You know, I mean, you can, if you look at columns differently, then it helps you look at and say, you can look at one number, like it's $10 a square foot. That doesn't really feel right to me, you know, or it's a dollar fifty a square foot or whatever it is. Sometimes you look and say, man, I can't take 70 man hours. 
you know, it's, there's a way, if you, you, if you present your information in a spreadsheet in a way where you can see different calculations on, on the pricing or the production, then it, you can get that gut check feel uh, whether or not, does that seem right? If it's something that doesn't seem right in one of the columns, then go back and look at the whole thing. You know, and go, yep. you know, because once in a while I'll do that. And then, no, it's right. Okay, well, then move on. Or, you know, now I think this needs to change a little bit. That's also where, you know, when you're looking at a true estimating system, kind of the advantages that over Excel kind of come into play also a little bit there, though, is when you sit there and say that I've got some sort of quantity. You know, in Excel, you could do some basic basic math where maybe I go ahead and have a quantity. You know, I've got a productivity. So yards divided by the uh, productivity might tell me how many hours. So I don't know if you noticed or not, but basically when I started off, this was some other number. So if I change the productivity, it's easy enough that this number divided by that gives me the number of hours. But when you think about like a spreadsheet or some of those type of things, if I change a quantity, that actually went back the opposite way and actually back calculated some other columns. So this, a lot of these estimating systems out there can actually go through the math in more than one direction. So where an Excel spreadsheet, if I would have went to the number of hours and just changed it, everything would have been out of whack for my formulas and things of that nature, where in a true estimating system, a lot of them are kind of set up for, you know, let me change this total or let me back calculate this. Same way like where uh, Kurt mentioned a moment ago, you know, I might know that uh, the market will bear a certain unit price. Maybe I want to see what that looks like for 10 bucks a, uh, a yard. Well, that means you're going to have to get it done in six and a half hours. That means it's going to take two yards an hour for their productivity. Does that sound realistic? So that way I can actually take that one bit of information and twist it two or three different ways to try to think through, would this unit price fly? Is this realistic for the field or things like that? So one company that I worked with that was kind of interesting because they had all these columns hit. When they build an estimate, they basically give it a quantity, they give it a unit price, and it comes up with an amount. And one of their estimators got a hold of me one day and he's like, how do I print a field report? And it knows the number of hours? Because that's what they were taught. They would build an estimate and then they would turn around and print a field report. And because those columns were high, they didn't even realize that the hours were going on behind the scene that helps because some people might only know certain content where other people might need to know, no, the hours are important to me. I don't know what unit prices are. So that's the, ability, that's the nice thing about the ability of like spreadsheet type of systems that, hey, let me turn that information on or off based on who's sitting in the driver's seat. So one thing I will say is this. Um, we do advocate, no matter what, that you have a modern estimating system. I will say that. Uh, there's a lot of value in tools like this. We don't care which one. Well, we do care a little bit which one you get, but we don't really care which one you get. The fact of the matter is if you have a modern estimating tool, which means something other than Excel, or you, you do, there are real advantages to it if you learn it and use it. And <clears throat> things like this are those kinds of things. And so there's more. But nevertheless, as we go on, we advocate a modern estimating system. We're not a peer side this time. That, that's for sure. But the practice should go through it. Yeah. So you talk about the art of science. Yeah. Well, specifically, we're talking about the science here. With Sage, have you ever blown out any of these locked forms? No. No, I have not. Yes. Okay. Can't. And so this data here, you guys are magnified. Are you full from means or do you? So you can't. Okay. So the, the one more question. Yeah. Again. You bet. And who do you have to Us. Me. He works for me. Yeah. <laughs> no. no, we're yeah, we're not going to represent it, so that's the prize. But so the thing that, um, as far as pricing goes, the pricing in this particular database is specifically wrong and, and wildly wrong because we don't want you using it straight out of the box so, ever. Uh, you can connect means data to this. This estimate, that estimating system, as well as many others, means it makes the data available to most estimating systems out there. So you can get, um, you know, you can plug in our estimating engine and a lot of other estimating engines to a means database so that it's their calculations, it's their pricing. <clears throat> when we set the estimate up, we can tell it 
you can tell it where the project is, so it pulls the appropriate pricing for the area out of the needs database. Okay, and that's that's common across many aspects of our systems. So, and and the one one real advantage over Excel is you cannot blow a formula. You can't you can't delete a formula. You can't overwrite it accidentally and things like that. You can't do a sum and not catch the entire column in this case. You know, so I mean there are things, there's a lot of risk in using Excel. We know we know a lot of this the most widely used estimating system out there is Excel. There's a tremendous amount of risk in using that. That is just inadvertent. I forgot to change the formula. I deleted the formula. I didn't catch everything in the columns title to total it up. I uh, overwrote the estimate file. Oh, I forgot to save it. I mean, I can go on and on. There's a lot of risk in using it, so. So, um, but it's nevertheless an estimating tool. A lot of the same practice that we talked about here apply across the board in terms of organization, how you can do takeoff, trying to look as many parameters as you can. And, and while this is the science of it, the hard math, this kind of thing is the art of, you know, what feels right. Would you say means is the most user friendly to search? Mm, well, I wouldn't say, I would I don't, the means data works the same as any other data with our product. <clears throat> I couldn't give you a judgment of does it work better with this product than Brand X. I don't know. I think the biggest thing I see is really what people are used to for pricing. Because we work with a lot of clients that have their own mm -hmm. uh, pricing and productivities. It's going to be more, hey, I want something like this, give me some some content started and go in and put their own twist to it. We work with a lot of other people, uh, clients and things like that also that, you know, I don't have that content where it's handy to be able to go to some resource like ours means and buy standard productivities and pricing and, and so yeah. forth. Real quick, so you said there is a means or a way to input your own pricing data and stuff that you may have on hand in-house? Yeah, you can, uh, the large majority of our customers would use their own structure, their own data, and how they do things. And normally you're going to use the standard database as a start, as a place to begin. Um, we offer a database also that's a hybrid of means and what I think of as verbal practical ways of putting it together. So that's a, um, that can be advantageous. It just depends. The data discussion for us, any estimating system, Database is an important part of that discussion at the early stages of it. And uh, uh, one we love to have, a little bit outside the scope of our particular class here today, but, but yes, always. So as I go through, this particular one, I've just kind of left everything, you know, organized by the way the database had it organized. So I can go through, and when I'm looking at the spreadsheet, maybe I can collapse things. So that way I can actually get maybe a uh, schedule of value type of totals out of the system if I've got my database organized that way. Um, now, what I want to do this time is I want to take all this out <coughs> and talk a little bit about organizing content better. So one of the things about wherever my mechanism of doing takeoff is, is by the time I get done with it, is that list of information something that I can do? Come back and change this. Come back and separate that. Do you feel comfortable that you got all the slabs here taken care of or this particular reference and things like that? So, you know, anything that I grouped, that I, that I, how I did that one, just at the mercy of just letting the database do what it wanted, you know, it's going to be by the divisions. But a lot of people don't sit there and do their takeoff by division. I don't necessarily do my reviewing by division either. So when you sit there and think about if I was really a general contractor where I do footings and I do slabs, you know, I might have in a footing formant, rebar, concrete. I might have in a slab uh, formant, wire mesh, or something like that in concrete. If I look at CSI, it's going to blend and put all the forming by each other, all the reinforcing by each other, and all the, the concrete by each other, which might be handy for pricing, but it might also be a very difficult way of reviewing that estimate to really know did I get all the footings taken care of or did I get that slab really taken care of and things of that nature. So the next thing I'm going to kind of go off in a little different direction here is something called WBS values. 
So WPS values stand for work breakdown structure, which is just some method to be able to group by that. Most WPS values seem like there's two main buckets that they fall under. Your clients are requesting it of you. So, you know, when you sit there and look at a bid for the first time, there's a lot of projects that, hey, I want you to give me this, and I want a price on this, 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 and this. So I might have a base bid and, you know, five alternates along the way. Or I might have something where, hey, I want to see building A separate from building B, something where they're kind of, you know, dictating how I group my estimate to give them the totals that they're requesting from me. There might be other types of uh, values that I use to make my life easier to come back and review the estimate. A lot of time on a bid, it doesn't matter if I saw footing one, footing two, footing three, footing four. The bid's going to lump all that together, probably most likely of how I'm going to give it to somebody. But if I had to come back and review it to make sure that my quantities were good, that I got all four types of footings covered, it would be handy for me to be able to go back and tell, hey, let me see it by detail, let me see it by footings, or something of that nature, to be able to group that content to go back and look at this later. So in this first run through here, what I want to take a look at is, just set the basic like location. I'm just going to say putting one. So I'm going to go back to an assembly and I'm just going to take off a moderate one here so I don't have any questions and generate some takeoff here. I'm going to come up here and say that I'm working on footing type 2 and just run through the exact same thing with maybe a couple different uh, dimensions out here. Maybe this one's a little bit uh, different size. So if I take a look at it the way the database is organized, it might be handy for pricing because all my like items are by each other. So if I'm working with, um, I'm going to work with a client that did a uh, drywall in a uh, building that was 100 floors and they can see each floor separate for their those different loads so that way when they actually go to do the project you know they can keep them separate and so forth but as far as each one they can see it also listed out here and, and lump them together so if I'm looking at this content and I say to uh, combine like items that will actually total all those duplicate items together so that way I can get a grand total of concrete in this case or grand total of drywall or whatever I was estimating at the moment. And if I hit undefined there, it'll go ahead and break it back out. The benefit to labeling things is the fact that if I come back and sort the estimate by that label, I now have all sorts of different totals by each one of whatever those headings were. So if that was base bid or alternate that we'll talk about after a while, or if that was you know phase one of the project versus phase two of the project, somehow I can keep that content separate to try to make sense out of it later. So think of it as tag, tagging your estimate, and it let, lets us use those tags to sort it in different ways. Like uh, Kevin mentioned in the multi-floor building as an example. If I'm thinking about that through the estimating process, I can use one of the WPS codes to indicate the floor. As I talked about from the very beginning, your job really doesn't end when the number is produced. So now we're successful bidder on the job, well, now I can produce reports that say, when you're ready to start, the concrete on this particular floor, here's what you need. Here's what you need for floor one, two, three, four. When, I'm, when you're starting the drywall, here's all the drywall related items for floor one, floor two, floor three, depending on the size of the project, you break it down finer than that. And now I can hand somebody in the field, here's what needs to happen, here's the materials you need to have, Here's what should be on site when you're ready to start that. Here's what subcontractors should be doing their thing. You know, all that can be produced by you when you are in the estimating process. And think about how much more efficiency the entire company gains when you're doing that work ahead of time. And it doesn't take much extra work on your part to really produce some fantastic information later on. I had a guy, uh, we showed him how to use this, do this. He goes, I saved back the cost of the system. I'm sorry, I'm just going to 
Same fact that caused the system just because he eliminated two guys running around getting stuff that they didn't have on the jobs that they needed that day, right? Yet two guys, again, they were now able to actually work on the job site instead of being in their truck getting stuff. So it can be helpful. And there's a ton of waste in construction. That's my number one. There is so much waste. And I'm not talking about the stuff you cut off and leave on the ground and put in the dumpster. I'm just talking about people waste, the amount of time people do things that they shouldn't have to do because they didn't know they didn't have to do it or they didn't know what they needed to have at the time they needed it. Massive amounts of waste. It can definitely be diminished to some degree if we do our, the right thing in estimate. So one client I worked with, one of the things that uh, they do that I found kind of interesting is they even put line items in their estimate they don't have any money. Because it's a reminder to someone else in the process that they thought about it and who's to cover it. So that way, you know, if they're a flooring contractor in this case and it was just like, you know, they get into cases where a lot of times the underlayment or the cement board underneath the tile is not installed. Who's, who was supposed to install that? Was that the homeowner? Was that the home builder? Is that them? So there again, the person going out to do the job has something in front of them that kind of, oh, well, homeowner was to do that or something of that nature. So that, that way they know if they end up doing it, maybe there's another charge associated with it or um, just kind of clarify on who's doing what steps. I've got other people that will go through it and put things in there about, you know, this job has none of this and that type of thing. So there again, it also just kind of reminds somebody that I thought about this and this particular job didn't have any at this point or something. Does that make a little bit of sense for the most part? So these headings that we use are really very, very powerful because they don't have to all be set up up front either. So you know, one of the biggest challenges that I think a lot of people face through the years is when I first started working with people, oh, the base bid, that's the most important thing. But it seems like a lot more people that I work with, you know, all these different options and all these other different, oh, well, yeah, you did this, now break this out, and now separate that, and doing the other things with it is becoming just as time consuming as whatever that first initial thought was on what I needed to put together. So if I take a look at in this particular case, let's say that for whatever reason, I need to break this out by what month this work is going to be done had nothing to do with how I built this estimate, but somebody came back to me after the fact and said, hey, I want to know that this is done in February and this is going to be done in March or phase one or phase two or whatever the little game is that we're doing that's different. It doesn't matter what the, the topic really is entirely. So I can go back in and look at um, settings. And right now I've got a heading out here, and I'm just going to utilize this uh, this bid item one for the moment. Right now nothing's under. So what if I could go through and change my tabs in, and I'm going to say I want something that sorts by location, and then by that bid item. So this is almost the same look I had before, footings one, footing two, some sort of content. And what if I could go through there and just label things where I could go through and say, okay, let's go ahead and call this uh, some sort of a heading about So all we're basically doing at this point is almost just relabeling. I'm not having to get into a bunch of formula writing or anything of that nature. We're just basically relabeling what these different contents are. So maybe I'm gonna put a few of these into that same uh, heading and so forth here. So let's say. I might also get into being able to drag items from one heading to another, and that will also reallocate them. But now, if that was something that I really didn't know what the different months totaled up to be, 
I'm not writing a bunch of formulas or anything of that nature. I'm just going to put a different twist on that and say, okay, first I want to sort by bid item. And maybe I'll still have location in there just so we can see the, the reference if I needed it. So if I look at that case, there's everything that's done in February. There's everything in, in March or May or things of that nature. But the, the cool thing about that is as I go through, I can collapse it and get some sort of cost associated with each one that quick without writing a bunch of formulas or recalculating things and the risk of getting my math right. Because a lot of time if I start trying to sort an existing Excel spreadsheet, you know, a lot of my numbers might get a little bit changed and so forth. But that's kind of the neat thing about you know, a true system sometimes can go through and actually come up with those quantities for me as I jump back and forth with different ways of looking at the content. So regardless of what you're using though, you, this could be done during the process of estimating or let's say you're a successful bidder. That kind of information could be used to project cash flow, right? So if you can go back and reorganize your estimate in, a, in some type of a timeline, now you can produce a report for people that say, here's about what we're going to have to spend every month to produce this job. You know, and so there's a lot of data, a lot of information that can be derived from the estimate that you put together. And you want to always be thinking about that. What more can I do with this data? Because this data is really valuable. It can be really helpful down the line for your customers, or for your, your company and your customers, but primarily for your company. How can I help this company produce this job most efficiently? Because that's where we all, that's the way we all have jobs, that's how we all get paid, you know, all of that kind of thing. And so I always tell us mayors, think past bid day. Think past what you're doing right now, because it'll always be helpful. I'm going to take a look at uh, the totals on this one. So at this point, what I've got pretty much put together in this estimate is really my cost of this point of the game. So I've got my own labor material, equipment, some other, they come out with some sort of a total and so forth. So I might go in and actually create a, um, what they call add-ons. And add-ons are basically things in, in this particular product that allows me to go from um, you know, my cost up to like a loaded number or billable type of a number and so forth. So things a lot of time by percentages, sales tax, overheads, profits, bonds, uh, sometimes permits if I can get by with them being done with a percentage and so forth. So as I go through there and I pick certain ones for this particular job, um, I'm going to say sales tax and I'm going to go ahead and say I want to profit on it and maybe I've got some sort of a bond. That can then come up with some sort of a grand total. If I look at my estimate closer, So we're not looking at as much detail. So, matter of fact, let's go back to the uh, months. So when I look at those months again, total amount was my cost. Add-on amount actually is broke down all the different um, sales tax fee bond per the particular section. So that way I can actually see this is a total that I can give to somebody that would include its portion of whatever I put on that total page there. So that way I can, um, you know, when somebody has to do a schedule of values, it's not really my cost that I want to sum up and things like that. I basically want that schedule of values to be all my different add-ons built into that number and so forth. So uh, as I'm building percentages at the bottom or I change these percentages and so forth, you know, that's going to go back and affect that spreadsheet of what those different numbers are. And it actually does that on every line item as it goes through the estimate. So I can actually look at one particular item like that estimate put in my machine and tell basically how much of it is my cost, how much of it is you know, the overhead and profit, and how much that item is of that grand total. So this is also critical for some of our clients that do a lot of negotiated work and things of that nature where what, what can we take out to get this to fit in that window? So that way I'm not guessing that, you know, uh, $272 is what that line is worth cost-wise that I might see, you know, just off in a spreadsheet, I can actually tell that that's actually got, you know, $318 is how much it's going to affect the bottom line if we decided, you know, can we pull that out, can we do something else with that line, 
uh, those type of things. So I can kind of see how much that value is on each line item pretty darn quick. So the next thing I want to take just a quick look at and, and so forth, just to kind of also tie in with some of the other comments that's been flying around and, and uh, so forth in different sessions is, is, you know, BIM is becoming very popular to get quantities from, uh, different takeoff systems to allow you to do, you know, there was an assembly session this morning. So I want to take a look just a little bit on just grabbing something out of a uh, image and then also pushing that through to my estimate because I think that's another place that uh, Visual takeoff is probably one of the leading things that a lot of estimators are getting more and more into from, you know, used to use digitized boards and order methods to almost everything is some sort of a image where they're doing 2D or some sort of a, um, you know, BIM compliant where I've got a model that's got a lot of the dimensions associated with it. Yeah, there's a lot of digital takeoff systems. They all work very similarly. You, I don't know, you, if you're using a spreadsheet, I don't care why, you want to use one of these systems. They're not that expensive. And uh, even if you're just pulling off the quantities and literally manually calculated, you want to use this no matter what. And uh, there's plans for them, there's on center, there's several of, you know, digital takeoff systems out there. And uh, we, we don't represent any of the two I mentioned, but it's, but they all work very, very similarly. No matter what, you want to be using one of these, no matter what. Uh, you know, Period, and uh, they're not that expensive. No reason not to. Yeah. So, so quick question on, on your reporting. Um, so when you're actually tracking like post bid, and you're utilizing, say, whatever software. Uh, so you're saying this reporting? Have you used or have you heard in the past where your clients are closing the uh, That I know we get kind of dorky in estimating. Can that super interpret those reports from, let's say, say, are they having any translation issues with using that reporting? I guess the super opinions, are they getting confused by any of that style of reporting instead of, let's say, like uh, Microsoft Project or you know, Yeah, it kind of depends on who am I passing information to. So, for example, you know, I may not give somebody that whole entire spreadsheet, right, right. but maybe someone running the job, maybe we do a field report that would say, okay, here's the line items of what you're going to be working on. Because a lot of time in, in most companies of size, a lot of them have some sort of costing that they also track the cost by. So it's handy to be able to say, okay, here's your cost code. Here's the line items that associate with that cost code and how much quantities or how much productivities or how much hours they have to complete that task. And maybe I don't show them any of the rest of the costs. Okay. So that way, based on you know who I'm trying to present to. So you're hiding. Right? Yeah, you might hide because there again, maybe I want to print something out and get it to a client. Right. That schedule oh, values. Right. I might just show a description of the grand total and don't have anything else in there. So as I go through there, each one might be kind of related. I've got some people that um, might do like a bill of material list, so, so that way they can you know shop out prices and give it to somebody. Of, hey, go do some research with these quantities, and you know where can we get better pricing breaks and so forth. So in this case, all I'm going to do is we talked about a slab earlier. I'm going to just throw a couple slabs in there, uh, just to kind of show you a little bit of, of uh, you know how some of these things can potentially aid in time. There are some settings that can actually make this go a little bit faster and so forth also, but I just want to kind of go through some very basic. So I basically just drew a area there. Maybe I can give that area some sort of a description slab one versus slab two or whatever I want and so forth on that regard to things. <laughs> so in the audit trail I might see, you know, each one of the different slabs that I've drawn out and what's associated with it. If I want to pull that over to like an estimating side of things, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, this little bridge that I'm looking at is actually a little middleman that's actually used between, um, you know, some of the main products out there. So, you know, this links with uh, the assembly, this links with the Navis works and so forth. Uh, it also works with the Z takeoff that uh, as of now, I'm just going to open up an existing project that I already started here. 
So these are the same list of assemblies that I just had on the other side. So if I said that I want to have a um, slab, If I grab this takeoff for that first slab I did, drain it over, that will actually oops, that will pull all the dimensions off of whatever I documented in that visual takeoff site. So this is all the stuff that's in my image software. This is all those questions that I looked at earlier that were in Sage that you know I need to quantify to be able to take this slab off. So the only thing I'm going to worry about at this point is I'm going to grab some area, move it over to area. I'm going to grab that um, description, and I'm going to grab, drop it down here on location so it'll put it in all those locations for me. I can hit plus until it's calculated. Click that, and it'll push it back to my estimating. I'm going to open that same uh, slab back up. Drag the next one down. Once you've done it once, if it recognizes that assembly, you'll notice that it's already mapped out area and it's already mapped out that location that it's gradually getting smarter because I've done that once. It knows what to fill out for that slab. Now, I still may have to come back in here and maybe this slab doesn't require any sand and you know change up some of the specs that weren't in the uh, visual image itself, but I'm basically kind of getting a lot of these quantities over there to to automate for me. So I go ahead and say, okay, there, hit plus. That's going to cast that all back to my spreadsheet and so forth. So if I go ahead and tell it to go back to my estimate now, there's the same estimate we saw before, but it was more generated from some sort of an image to help get me started. If I take a look at sorting it by location, I can still see the same, you know, whatever references I want. So if I want to keep this footing from that footing, this wall from that wall, this building from that building, some of those type of things to be able to keep that all labeled and separated as far as we're doing those. The other thing that's pretty powerful about a lot of these different um, systems is when somebody comes back and, and I change something. So let's say in my case I want to edit a point and let's say for some reason uh, I'm just going to make this slide a little bit longer than it was a while ago. If I close that estimate up and I go back to the bridge, the bridge can actually go through and show me the content that I've changed. So in this case here, if I go to review, it's going to show me these two different areas. If I pull up the slab here, it's going to show me my original quantity was 300. What's currently in my image right now is 400 some. So I can tell it to update my estimate and it will actually then move those new numbers over to my spreadsheet if something changed. So a lot of time when I get into cases where uh, some of the different content gets moved around or changed and things like that, you can come into to the um, review and actually go back and re-push those quantities over to get whatever changes. And that's about all I'm going to probably go through on that, just to kind of give you an idea of getting some quantities over there. <clears throat> the main thing is you want to use a you know, digital takeoff system. It makes it a lot of easier. It'll cut half the time out of your estimate immediately by using one. Again, an accuracy issue as well. You want to, you know, they're going to increase your accuracy. Um, allow you to retrace your steps, find what you've taken off and what you have it. They all very similar in operation. Just, there's just a lot of good reasons to take out. So, so let's say that I've got this estimate together. Uh, somebody wants us to do some changes to it. So what I want to take a look at now is really just going through and making a copy of this estimate, going back and making some changes, and then doing some comparative type of reports to try to show you know where did some things change as we went through. So if I go through and I'm going to close this down and go up to file, copy estimate. What do I want to copy? I 
new name. I'm just going to go back and just do a, a very quick uh, couple little things. So I'm going to say that for whatever reason, footing two isn't going to happen until next year for some reason. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of an increase on labor material. So I might go through here and say, okay, labor I want to take up by 2%. So I can actually highlight something and say I want to adjust that column by 2%. And maybe the materials, I'm going to go ahead and take them up 5% for some reason. Say the labor, I'm going to adjust that by 3%, and maybe 5% on the material. So in this case here, anything that has a little red mark next to it is basically what I've adjusted. It'll tell me what that percentage was. I could also highlight that and actually tell it to undo it, and it would go back to whatever the original values were. If I were to take a look at some of the reporting, this is probably, um, let's say I was to hide a lot of this content. I may want some very, very generic report depending on one person I'm giving that information out to. So I might come in here and say combine. Uh, maybe I want to go ahead and say that these are some sort of uh, like detail references. So one of the reports out there is something called a spreadsheet report. And the advantage of this report that's kind of nice is this little prefill will mimic whatever you've done in the spreadsheet. So if you taught it, these are the five columns I want to show that person. I want to rename the columns to what they would know it by, things like that, because sometimes if I call it takeoff quantity or labor quantity, just call it hours, or just call it productivity. So I can kind of clean it up so that way it will help somebody else if I'm handed this to it, maybe understand what that value represents. A uh, common one that we run into all the time is something as simple as like cost code. You know, some people call it phases, some people call it cost codes, or things of that nature that, you know, having whatever that consistent wording is can be the difference between someone knowing what that is and confusion sometimes. If I preview that then, it's going to show me something just as basic as what I taught it to do. So it's got, you know, my detail for that description, it's got just a couple columns to it and so forth, uh, very customized to what I just built. If I say save layout, if it's something I'm going to reproduce on a regular basis, I could actually save that and say, this is a client view, this is a field view, this is the owner's view, or things of that nature, this is my schedule of values, and actually create some sort of a library of what are these standard looks that I want to produce out of the estimate. This is what our bill of materials is going to look like. This is what our field report is going to look like. Some of those type of um, <coughs> reports. If I take a look at, we've talked about a couple times, uh, field reports and so forth, so if I just took a look, <coughs> And um, I'm going to put a little bit of a twist on it. So instead of sorting it the way the database is organized, I'm going to tell it I want to sort it by location and maybe by uh, material class. Material class. <clears throat> so in this case here, for the footing, it might show each material class what item I had, what quantity, what productivity I thought they could get, how many hours they've got to get that done in some duration of time? So again, it, we take time to label things, and any, again, any estimate we're putting together, we take time to organize our data. You can handle this, you know, if the superintendent knows, I'm gonna be pouring this footing tomorrow, or the next day. I know how much concrete I'm gonna need to order, all that kind of thing is pretty much right there in my hands. You can put these things in 
electronic form and supply them on a tablet. You don't have to print them on paper these days. So it all depends on how you're running your company. But we can, you know, put all this stuff in electronic form. They can flip through it and go, okay, this is where I'm going to be uh, working tomorrow or the next week or whatever it is. Here's the things I'm going to need to have in order to get the job done properly. It also budgets their time. And I've always been a big believer, if I've been as, as, as an estimator, if I could produce uh, some kind of man, my man hour estimate, then the guys in the field know what we were aiming for. And I had, I've had some people say, well, I don't really want to tell them how many hours because then they'll make sure to use that. And I'm like, hey, if they use just that many, you're okay. I'd rather have them know they, they have 120 man hours to get this done in than assume they have 160. You know, and then go, wait a minute, I, nobody told me that I only had 120 because I would have done something different. So more information is better information. And as an estimator, you can provide that through your process right up front. And so that's one of the things that I, I get to is you can make the entire company more effective if you're adding a few things into the process when you're putting an estimate together. And that's another thing that's kind of interesting between yeah. companies. Oh, just a question. Can this product, I'm just say that this product, yeah. use as a real-time, real-time relating to the updating quantities? Tell me what you mean by that. Well, okay, if I, if I say concrete, I, I have a lot of 50 cubic yards. I've poured 10 so far. Yeah. And I go in. Okay. Could I do that in here? Yes. No. Okay. There are ways to do it with... Other products. Other products. I'm not yeah. I'm just asking about this one. Yeah. There are in other vendors too, like uh, Procore, ESA, lots of companies have ways to do your daily reports with your updated yeah, right. yeah. Okay. And that's really what the function I've used is a daily report function. So this is only estimating only. It, it can't be updated for actual. Yes, correct. Okay. Yep. Now we can combine data and get it from some other source. But it always give, it give you a comparison. Yeah. If anybody else leaves, I'm not giving all tissue pads. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take a look at another report then. So let's say I want to look at a uh, variance. So a variance will let me compare two estimates side by side. Uh, now, the variance will compare two estimates side by side, so it'll calculate the difference. There's a comparison report, it's the same thing, that can show 10 estimates side by side. So if I want to show really a bigger picture of where we've been along some cycle. So for this first shot, I want to keep it real generic. So I might go through and say, I don't want to see any other unit costs or anything like that. I just want to see a total based on those locations that we had earlier. And I want to summarize it by location. So in this case, it's going to be a very, very simplistic um, look going on this is going to basically say footing one you have so much money footing two or excuse me footing one basically we didn't change so it's variance is zero but maybe in this one here's case you know we've ended up taking um, and adding $69 to it because of the increase on the labor material that we put at it so it has a very nice presentation to kind of show where we've went along the way and maybe what sections changed this can get all the way down to, if I want to get a lot of detail, I'm going to turn off the total at the moment and say, show me the quantity. Now, that I didn't change any of the quantities here, but I can go through and actually show, let's see how much detail. This could actually show every single quantity and what it's changed. So if for some reason we went back for a value engineer job and we said, yeah, let's reduce this quantity or change this or things like that, any of those columns are possible. And you can have them all show up if you've got a, almost a plotter to print them because there's about uh, 25 different columns there that you can print so it gets to be pretty wide if you try to do them all but it's kind of nice because I can go through and just look at hey I want to see where the quantities change I want to see where the hours change I want to see where the money changes and things of that nature and it can kind of bring this to light to my attention point being oftentimes is you know if you're prepared to give a comparison between two versions of an estimate it sure helps people that are making the decisions on how to do the job and so, again, you want to think about those kinds of things in the process. How, how easy is it for me to pull, you know, two or three different versions of an estimate, 
come up with here's why they're different, here's where they're different at. And so we look at that and say, yeah, we can we can do that and that makes sense, or we can't, or this is not the area where we can uh, save money on the project, or this is not the area where we should be adding money to the project, or whatever it is. So at this point, is there any questions on any of this stuff? And we'll, I'd say, uh, pull up that kind of bid management report, and that's what we're going to have. Um, so, you know, we also talked about it's great to have some way to manage your overall bids and your overall spent files and so forth. And again, it can, you can extract data from that. I can extract really valuable business data from that. And, you know, so I can see who's estimating what, what the value of the estimates are and so forth. I can get things like we talked about earlier. I'm not going to show you every last thing because you want to get out of here so we you know where jobs are won what's uh where am i winning most where am i most likely to succeed where am i most likely to fail etc and you know this again you know this might be a basic estimating class i want you all to think i want you to be thinking about where you can go what you should be thinking about because as an estimator the more you think about the entire process from beginning to end, from the beginning of that project to, to when it's potentially completed. And the more information you can provide up front that helps the executives of the company make better decisions, the more valuable you are in that company, period. Whether you own the company, whether you're an employee, I don't care what you are, but the more you can do to say give people insight Here's where we're winning. Here's where we're not winning. Here's the competitors that are particularly tough in this kind of work. All that information is valuable information in running a business. And an estimator really can provide a tremendous amount of value to a company. You know, it's, it's kind of sometimes one of those departments kind of, it's not the one that everybody thinks about all the time. You know, it's the, it's the guys in the, you know, crunching the numbers back there. The fact of the matter is those numbers mean a lot. And they can be very, very valuable in how the company operates, what kind of jobs they choose to pursue, what kind of jobs they win, how you, how you price a job, how you negotiate a job. All those things come from data like this. And <clears throat> you as estimators, if you're thinking about all those parameters, you can provide this extremely by bag to the company. So, any questions? Otherwise, we'll let you go. Was it worth your time? I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.